there's something kind of poignant about the image of a man walking resolutely through the wilderness, alone, his enemies pursuing him. He keeps going, one foot in front of the other, until he can't anymore. A lone tree looms ahead of him and he collapses underneath it to wait for death. It reads almost like the scene from a, a classic Western film. One man at the end of all things, resources exhausted, strength and courage spent, dying alone in a wild and inhospitable place. But this lone, worn down man is no ordinary wanderer. He is Elijah, one of God's great prophets, faithful, bold, a doer of great deeds in God's name. God has done extraordinary things for Elijah and through Elijah. So how did he end up here, alone, afraid, and ready to give up? Turning back a few pages in our Bibles to see what Elijah has been up to, what he did that so enraged King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, well, it doesn't actually help us understand why Elijah is so despairing. He's just won an epic showdown against the prophets and priests of Baal, a made-up god that a lot of Israel had taken to worshiping. Baal had 450 priests. Elijah was alone, the last true prophet of God in all Israel. And the deal was this, Baal's priests would take one bull and Elijah the other. They'd set them up on their respective altars, then call on their respective gods to consume the sacrifices with fire. So the priests of Baal, all 450 of them, did just that. They put the bull on the altar and they chanted and danced and called on Baal and again and again and again until they were just limping around the altar and nothing happened. Then Elijah steps forward. He repaired the altar to God that had been destroyed. He laid wood and put the bull's meat on it. Then he had them pour 12 jars of water over it, soaking the altar, the wood, the meat, and even the ground. And then he just asked, answer me, Lord, so that the people will know that you, O Lord, are God. And the meat burned, and the wood burned, and then the stones burned, and the dust burned, and even the water pooled around the altar on the ground. That burned too. And all the people fell down and agreed that the Lord is indeed God. And Elijah and the people together captured and killed all the priests of Baal. This is a triumph, an extraordinary act of God worked through the extraordinary faith and courageous witness of Elijah. King Ahab of Israel went and told his wife Jezebel, a fanatic Baal worshiper, and she swore to likewise kill Elijah. And Elijah, fresh off this great triumph, runs away, afraid, and he keeps running until he is exhausted. He collapses under a tree and asks God to die. So you see what I mean? Knowing what's just happened between the priests of Baal versus Elijah and God, knowing all that still doesn't help us understand how Elijah, prophet of God, doer of great deeds, could be brought so low, so fast. It seems unfaithful of Elijah, ungrateful towards God, unwise even. It'd be perfectly understandable for God to tell Elijah to buck up, to stop being sorry for himself. Or God might have given him a stern talking to about what being a prophet really means. Or reminded Elijah of the great things that God has accomplished through him. Or even lectured him about growing in his faith through this new trial. But God does none of these things. When Elijah prayed for death, laid down under that tree and fell asleep, I doubt if he expected to wake up. But wake he did, at the touch of an angel who prepared food for him. Elijah slept and ate again and then made a 40-day journey to the mountain of God. When the Lord asks Elijah what he is doing there, Elijah responds with a lament, a litany of his pain, his fear, his frustration and loneliness. 
I have served you faithfully, but the people have abandoned you and the promises held dear between you. I am the last of your prophets, and they are coming to kill me too. It's heartbreaking to hear. But this is not, strictly speaking, an accurate report of how things are. After the whole priests of Baal showdown, the people did start to look to God again. And as we will hear soon, there are prophets and kings and faithful people still in, left in Israel. But still, God answers Elijah's lament. Now, Elijah was used to spectacular revelations from God, as he had received when taking apart the priests of Baal. That is what Israel needed in that moment, another overwhelming display of the Lord their God. But that's not what Elijah needed now. So a powerful wind tore the mountain apart, but God wasn't in the wind. And a mighty earthquake shook the mountain, but God wasn't in the earthquake. And finally, a fire blazed on the mountain, but God wasn't in the fire. God was in the gentle voice, speaking into silence that asks Elijah again, what are you doing here? And God listens to Elijah's answer. When Elijah is at his worst moment, the absolute lowest point in his life, God feeds him, gives him the strength he needs to get to safety, and listens to the lament of his broken heart and flagging spirit. God is exactly, perfectly what Elijah needs, at the high point of his greatest triumphs and public victory, and also at the low point of private pain and despair. God is with Elijah, wherever he is. There's both a lesson and good news for us in this story. Hitting rock bottom, finding ourselves as low as we've ever been, feeling exhausted, scared, or just plain not okay. That does not move us out of God's reach, and it doesn't mean our faith is small or fragile. We don't always have to be brave and effective, positive and hopeful, patient and at peace with whatever happens. It's okay to get angry, to be afraid, to be frustrated, to be sad, to be tired, as long as we take those feelings to God. Turning to God, even, maybe especially, in the worst moments of our lives, is a faithful act. It's okay to fall down because God is there. We know God, just as Elijah did, to be a God who is amazing, powerful, creating, holy, passionate in his love for the poor, the vulnerable, and the lost. God is all-knowing, eternal, just, steadfast, in his promises to his people. And yet, God also speaks of himself as a parent to his people, as our parent. And that's pretty up close and personal. Jesus encouraged us to follow his example, thinking and speaking about God as our Father. But it's, it's here in the Old Testament, too. God spoke of rescuing Israel from slavery in Egypt, as being like a father carrying his son to safety through the wilderness. God speaks of his memories of Israel being like those of an indulgent and loving parent who scoops up their child and kisses their cheek as they learn to walk. And I can't help but see some of that parental love right here in how God is with Elijah when he is at his lowest point. How many of us have gone to a parent or someone who has been like a parent to us when we were brought low by pain, by fear, by frustration or loneliness or exhaustion. And how many of us were sat down, fed and listened to and loved and picked up and put back on our feet. That is how God is with Elijah in this lowest moment of his life. And that is how God is with us too. Elijah matters to God, we matter to God not because of any great feats of discipleship we perform. We matter to God not because we can overcome fear and exhaustion and worry all on our own either. We matter to God because God loves us and cares for us. God tending to Elijah 
caring for him, feeding him, listening to him, and loving him, it didn't magically fix everything. But God did give Elijah what he needed to keep going. The last part of what God says to Elijah about going to Damascus and anointing people as prophets and 7,000 faithful people still living in Israel, that's God giving Elijah purpose, hope, meaning, and even companions again. It's the answer to his lament. Not all of Israel is lost. You will not be killed. You are not alone. And that is exactly what Elijah, one of God's great prophets, faithful, bold, a doer of great deeds in God's name, that is exactly what Elijah needed. And God gave it to him. Like Elijah, when we, at times, have run as far as our strength can take us, and we're ready to lay down under our own shade trees and give up, God responds with life and with hope. In every situation, even maybe especially when we're at our lowest point, God makes redemption possible for us. He makes restoration, freedom, healing, and wholeness possible whether it's from our own sinfulness or from our suffering because of the sins of others. Turning to God with our pain, our exhaustion, our hopelessness, our fear, that is a profoundly, deeply faithful thing to do. And when we do, we know that God cares, God listens, and God will give us what we need. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs>